Greetings, and welcome back, gentles and ladiesmen, to another Hey Doxic episode of Remake or Rebreak. I'm X the Paradigm Gamer, and it's finally time to get to a video I promised months ago. Time sure flies when you're back at college. Without further ado, it's time to discuss Kirby's Adventure for the NES and Kirby Nightmare in Dreamland for the Game Boy Advance. In 1992, a little game called Kirby's Dreamland launched for the Nintendo Game Boy, and saw our favorite puffball setting out on a quest to retrieve Dreamland stolen food from the greedy king DDD. Unlike most platformers of the time, which focused on jumping on or perhaps rolling into enemies, Kirby stood out for his vacuum like inhale ability, which allowed him to take in enemies or blocks and spit them out as stars. It's not an especially lengthy or innovative game, you can beat the whole thing in less than an hour, but it's still a cute little game for what it was. The only other thing of note is that Kirby's skin tone used to be a ghostly white, and it wasn't until the next game came out on NES that the iconic pink puff gained a signature complexion. Regardless, Kirby's Dreamland did well enough to land a sequel on the Nintendo Entertainment System in 1993. One of the latest releases for the system, and publishing two years after the Super Nintendo made its global debut, the game takes advantage of its bigger cartridge space to offer one of the most technically impressive adventures on the NES. Kirby's Adventure was well received for its time and remains a fan favorite installment in the series to this day, with many NES enthusiasts considering it one of the best games on the system. Following a series of progressive and somewhat regressive sequels and spin offs, developer HAL Laboratory remade Kirby's Adventure in 2002 as Kirby Nightmare in Dreamland for the Game Boy Advance. I'm not sure why Meta Knight is on the cover when he plays such a minor role in the story, but at least the new title is a little more specific to what happens in the game. A full remake of the 1993 classic, the gaming community received Nightmare in Dreamland just as well as the original. As usual, I'd like to discuss how well Kirby's Adventure holds up today, and further elaborate on how well Kirby Nightmare in Dreamland recreates and improves upon the original experience. Without further ado, this is Kirby's Adventure Remake or Rebreak. Kirby's Adventure has a surprisingly well-developed plot, even featuring a well-presented introductory cutscene. After waking up from a rough night of sleep, Kirby realizes that he and his fellow Dreamlanders can no longer dream. Upon investigating the wellspring of the subconscious, the fountain of dreams, he discovers the egocentric King DDD taking a bath in its waters. The selfish monarch has divided the fountain's power source, the Star Rod, into seven pieces and handed them off to his underlings. Vying to restore proper sleep to Dreamland, Kirby sets off to tour the seven realms of Dreamland, reassemble the Star Rod, and put King DDD back in his place. While the remake doesn't include the classic intro sequence, it does showcase 128 Kirbys running on screen which is technically impressive in its own right. The intro cutscene itself is relatively the same as the original, but utilizes a stylized, updated presentation. While the setup is pretty standard for a platforming game, the ending might surprise you. I won't spoil it, but suffice it to say that there's more to the story than you might think. Kirby's Adventure is also noteworthy for introducing the fan favorite Meta Knight, a mighty warrior and friend-slash-enemy of Kirby depending on the circumstances. Meta Knight and his minions appear regularly throughout the game attempting to thwart your progress. Let's kick off the review with the first thing you'll see, the graphics. Kirby's Adventure is a beautiful game for the NES, sporting a vibrant color palette, beautiful backgrounds, and nice looking sprites. Some of the animations look a little stiff, but that's the worst I can say about them. A large part of what makes it work is the fantastic art direction. So many NES platformers sport backgrounds that are bland and uninteresting at best, and lots of first party games fall into this trap. I'm sure limited memory was responsible, but it nevertheless made for some fun ugly looking environments. In contrast, Kirby's Adventure offers some truly gorgeous backdrops, featuring a skillful blend of warms and cools, detailed set pieces, and a much appreciated sense of perspective. Many areas also incorporate some creative visuals that you can't find in any other Kirby game. The music is great as well, further accentuating the many levels and boss battles. Many of these iconic tunes would reappear in subsequent Kirby games, most notably the themes to Grape Garden and Butter Building. I do have a couple quibbles with the presentation. For one, what's the deal with this weird bar at the side of the screen? The only other NES game I can think of that does this was Mario 3. Still, at worst, it's a mild distraction. The other issue is a little more substantial. Kirby's Adventure loves using multiple sprites for its visual effects, and they do look nice. Only problem is that these effects slow the frame rate to a crawl, and this can sometimes leave you open to attack. It's not game breaking, and I'm sure this was the best the hardware could do, but it's still a noticeable flaw in the game's performance and presentation. Nightmare in Dreamland is a sizable improvement when it comes to the aesthetics, as you'd expect from a remake on a more advanced console, but it's not as cut and dry as you might think. The sprites and backgrounds have been remade from the ground 
ground up, with the art direction following that established in Kirby 64, The Crystal Shards. When you compare Kirby's character designs from these titles, you can tell that they were going for a sleeker, more modernized look that I personally think suits the series a lot better. This translates well into the sprite art, which looks a lot more polished and better animated than that of the NES version. The backgrounds are a bit of a different story. While the foreground layer looks more or less like what you'd expect from a Kirby title, the actual backgrounds look like something you'd see in a Salvador Dali painting. While that sounds out of place in a Kirby game, it all works surprisingly well and makes for visually inspired environments. Compared to the frequent slowdown in the NES version, Nightmare in Dreamland offers a much more consistent performance. Even when the screen is crowded with visual effects, the frame rate never dips below 60 frames per second, making for a smoother play experience overall. In general though, I can't necessarily say Nightmare in Dreamland has better visuals than Kirby's Adventure overall. Both titles try out different art styles and succeed at them, and both offer great, unique visuals for their respective consoles. If I had to pick a favorite, I'd probably go with Nightmare in Dreamland for its improved sprite art and better performance, but I was nonetheless impressed by the original's lasting visual appeal. The music is similarly a matter of taste. If you love 8-bit chiptunes, you'll probably prefer the NES renditions, but if you're like me and prefer MIDI-like arrangements, you'll probably prefer the GBA renditions. One thing I do appreciate about the remake is that it adds a couple tracks that weren't in the original game, such as a remix of King Dedede's theme in a remix of Gourmet Race for the final face-off against the king himself. Personally, I think it's better than the actual King Dedede theme. That said, let's move on to the gameplay. Kirby's Adventure is a 2D side-scroller where you take control of Kirby to jump, float, and inhale enemies as you make your way through seven worlds on a quest to reassemble the Broken Star Rod. Kirby handles more or less like he did in Kirby's Dream Land, but it does admittedly annoy me that you have to press up to make Kirby float. Most future Kirby games let you do this with the jump button, so it messes with my muscle memory. It kinda reminds me of Sonic CD's wacky spin dash. Maybe I'm nitpicking, but transitioning from a jump to a float is so much smoother smoother when it's all on one button, and thankfully the remake fixes this. Kirby's Adventure's most significant contribution is the introduction of the copy ability. Whenever Kirby inhales an enemy with an ability, he can copy it to unleash one of 26 abilities against other enemies and bosses. These abilities range from fire breath, to a sword, to an electric whip. My favorite of the bunch is definitely the UFO, which can only be found in a handful of locations, but allows you to fly around and unleash the beam and laser abilities. For an NES game, this mechanic offers a surprising amount of variety and helps to balance out the often standard level design. Personally, while I think the copy ability system in Kirby's Adventure is a clever, fun idea, I do have a few complaints to discuss. One nitpick I have is that sometimes I'd forget that I had an ability and would try to suck up an enemy, only to take a hit. This is because Kirby himself doesn't really change his appearance to indicate what ability you have. Even a simple palette swap would have done the trick. To be fair, there is a little window in the HUD that shows you what ability you have, but it's stuck in the bottom of the screen, and the bland yellow palette blends in with the rest of the HUD. Compare this to future games, which use colorful distinct symbols for each ability. I did eventually realize in the middle of my extra mode playthrough that Kirby does change to a darker pink when you have an ability, but again, this change was so small that I barely even noticed it. Not a huge deal, but I would have done it differently. My second complaint is also pretty minor, but still worth mentioning. Every single time Kirby takes a hit while holding a copy ability, you lose the ability and have to re-inhale it. As you might imagine, this can get really annoying, especially since taking hits is something that happens relatively frequently. This doesn't really add anything meaningful to the game, and it just kind of gets in the way. My final complaint is a major one. Almost all of Kirby's copy abilities are designed in such a way that you have to stand in place to use them, and many of them have not so great range, which is pretty awkward if you're used to the more flexible abilities from future games. Some abilities, such as beam, flaming, and laser, are better than others in this regard, but these abilities can sometimes feel ill-suited to the controls and level design on display. Part of the problem is that most of these abilities are only designed to do one thing, usually a forward-facing attack, and some of them seem like they could be combined together for an overall more useful ability. Did we really need separate ice and freeze abilities, for example? And as long as I'm on the subject, the ball ability sucks... well, you know.
A related issue is the play control, and while it's not bad, it does feel kind of awkward compared to future Kirby titles. It's difficult to elaborate on awkward control, but if I had to pinpoint a specific problem, I'd say that Kirby's acceleration feels a little off, which, coupled with his small sprite size, makes him mildly slippery. Eventually, I did adjust to it, but even by my extra mode playthrough, I found myself taking hits because Kirby wasn't handling quite the way I expected. I know it looks like I'm playing like shit, but I swear that Kirby's attacks are all delayed just enough that enemies can often sneak in a hit before you do, and I never experienced this when I play any future Kirby games. There was a period where I felt like I was maybe experiencing bad input lag, but after a few more test playthroughs, I realized that maybe it was just that the attacks aren't as instantaneous as in the sequels, and that was what was throwing me off. Other than that, I can't really explain it. Suffice it to say that I find that future installments have smoother play control and more versatile attacks than this game does. Not surprisingly, Nightmare Dreamland resolves some of these problems. For one, the remake brings back the hat system from Kirby Superstar. For another thing, the window in the HUD now uses more visually distinct ability icons, and even the text shorthand uses bolder colors. Because of this, I was never confused as to whether I had an ability or not. In regards to the control, I'm inclined to say it's a sizable improvement over the original game. Kirby isn't quite as slippery, and his jumps and attacks feel a little more instantaneous, which works better with the level design. If I'm being honest, though, I still found myself taking unnecessary touch damage from enemies because of delays in Kirby's attacks, and unfortunately this isn't the only thing that wasn't improved. For one thing, Kirby still loses his copy ability every time he gets hit, and I don't understand why this was still a thing for such a long time. Another aspect the developers could have improved but didn't was bringing in the Kirby Superstar ability system, but I can understand why they might have opted out of that. Obviously, controls and mechanics are important, but none of that really matters if the level design isn't any good. Fortunately, Kirby's adventure delivers. For the most part. Right off the bat, I can give the game credit for its short stage length. Similar to Super Mario Bros. 3, stages are numerous, but can generally be completed in just a couple minutes and don't go on longer than necessary. Unique to Kirby's Adventure compared to future titles is its tendency to mix and match environments and backdrops within a single stage, which is pretty cool. This visual variety goes a long way in helping levels stay interesting as the game goes on. In terms of actual level design, however, Kirby's Adventure feels pretty... Bear? That's not to say it's bad. There's enemies to fight, star blocks to break, bomb blocks to blow up, and the occasional side room to snag extra lives, but it's nothing too remarkable for a side scroller of its time. The most interesting aspect by far is the big red switches hidden in some of the levels. To 100% your save file and unlock the game's extra mode, you'll have to find and press all of these buggers, which unlock optional doors in the area map. The game marks fully completed levels with a yellow door, and incomplete levels with a red door, so keeping track of switches is never an issue. While the direct reward for finding switches is pretty lackluster, I find that it makes the later sections of the game more fun to play simply because it gives you a reason to explore stages instead of casually plowing through them. The only problem is that these switches don't start popping up until Butter Building, and even even then, only in a couple of levels. The result is a game that's kind of boring to start with, but gets a lot more interesting as it goes along. Boss battles are fun, but can seem a little unbalanced sometimes. Like most games in the series, you'll sometimes come across mid-bosses, which take a few hits and then reward you with a copy ability afterwards. There's a nice variety, but I never look forward to fighting this turtle monstrosity. He likes to grab you and move around at light speed, and is generally just a pain in the ass to fight. Mid-bosses are noticeably larger in the GBA version, and oddly enough, the turtle has been replaced with an elephant. I'm not sure why, but I do have to thank the remake for slowing him down so I can actually dodge his attacks. The worst thing about world bosses is that, unlike most Kirby games, you're not given a choice of copy abilities before taking them on. If you want to bring in a copy ability to fight the boss, you'll have to bring it from a stage. Many of the bosses will give you copy abilities by inhaling their attacks, but many others don't. The bosses themselves are decent, but they pale in comparison to future Kirby titles in terms of being challenging, intricate boss fights. For what they are, however, they do the job. After you beat the game, you unlock a versus boss subgame on the main menu, which is called Boss Endurance in the GBA version. Compared to the arena subgames from future Kirby games, though, this subgame just kinda sucks. Those games let you pick your preferred copy ability and gave you healing items between bouts, but were still plenty challenging. This subgame just drops you in and leaves you to scavenge abilities from the bosses themselves. And because there are no healing items and only six hit points, you're basically not allowed to get hit at all. Even in Planet Robobot's grueling true arena, you were still allowed to take a 
couple of hits here and there. I can understand why the NES version would be this way, but it's disappointing that the remake couldn't update the subgame to make it more like the Superior Arena subgame from Kirby Superstar. Speaking of the difficulty, Kirby's Adventure is typical for the series, but pretty tame for an NES game. Perhaps that's owing to its late release and targeting of more casual players, but experienced gamers will be hard-pressed to reach the game over screen. To be clear, that's not necessarily a bad thing, as most NES games were only as hard as they were because of cheap game design meant to screw over Western players who rented the game instead of buying it. Castlevania 3 in a nutshell. For one thing, both the NES and GBA versions include an autosave feature, meaning you don't have to marathon the entire game in one sitting, and you're allowed to continue indefinitely. For another thing, Kirby has a 6 point life bar and can find ample healing items spread throughout the stages. Most enemies die in one hit, while bosses of all sizes can be defeated in about 6 or 8. Lives are also plentiful, be they found in stages or as a reward for playing the subgames. The difficulty design makes for a very accessible, casual experience for newcomers and veterans alike. If you're looking for a game that'll kick your ass, like all the epic yarn detractors seem to be, you're not going to find it here. Nevertheless, I think most people will find this game to be a fun, relaxing romp, low difficulty aside. One thing I've noticed is that some people seem to think that Nightmare in Dreamland is considerably easier than the original version. I would agree that the GBA version is slightly easier than the original, but only because of the control improvements I mentioned earlier. For the most part, bosses and levels sport more or less the same physics, attack strategies, stage hazards, etc. The only real difference is that the boss sprites have increased in size, which I guess makes them a little easier to hit, and that Fan Fan has been fine-tuned over the turtle, which I consider a positive addition. Overall, I wouldn't say that the remake has been made so much easier than the original as to detriment the original experience. As I touched on earlier, Kirby's Adventure contains a total of seven worlds, and each one is organized in a side-scrolling area map. Each world contains about four to six levels, but also contains a number of extra doors that lead to some optional goodies. And like I said, you'll have to press the red switches to access some of them. The most noteworthy of the optional doors, however, take you to one of three subgames, which you can play to snag yourself some extra lives between stages. Crane Fever takes the form of the ever loath Skill Crane, tasking you with fishing out the small and large Kirby dolls for one or two lives a pop. I swear the game is really temperamental about grabbing the big one though, so good luck with that. Egg Catcher sees Kirby inhaling as many eggs as he can while avoiding bombs. It's harder than it sounds. Finally, Quick Draw sees Cowboy Kirby attempting to draw his weapon before a series of five opponents. Basically, depending on how fast you press the button after the prompt shows up, you'll either beat the enemy or lose. It's a fun idea, but this subgame was clearly designed for a low latency CRT and not a plasma or LCD screen TV, so good luck finishing this minigame if you have a flat screen. Believe it or not, Nightmare in Dreamland has two new subgames and one returning one. In Bomb Rally, Kirby is tasked with lobbing a cartoon bomb back and forth using a frying pan while trying to fake out his opponents. The more competition he outlasts, the more lives you win. In Kirby's Air Grind, my personal favorite of the bunch, Kirby grinds along a rainbow rail while avoiding the spiky sections. The better you can time your button presses, the faster you'll go, and the better time you'll get. You'll get a certain number of lives depending on when you place. Finally, the Quick Draw minigame, which was reimagined as Samurai Kirby for Kirby Superstar, returns in a similar form for Nightmare in Dreamland. It plays just like the NES incarnation, but because it was designed for an LCD screen, it factors in the proper latency and is possible to fully complete on a new TV. All three subgames offer three difficulties and support local multiplayer. Overall, the subgames are a good time. After beating the game, 100%, you'll unlock the game's extra mode, returning from Kirby's Dreamland. In this harder mode, your life bar is halved and you're not allowed to save, but you are thankfully given unlimited continues. While this may sound like a tall order, I can personally blaze through Kirby's adventure in about two and a half hours. Beating the game on extra mode unlocks a sound test, which is a nice reward for your trouble. Extra mode returns in a similar form for Nightmare in Dreamland, but this time you're allowed to save your game. Believe me though, it doesn't really make extra mode that much easier. Since the sound test is available in the GBA version from the get-go, finishing extra mode unlocks a new subgame called Meta Nightmare, which would later reappear in Superstar Ultra and Planet Robobot. Essentially, it's like extra mode, except you play as Meta Knight, who 
who can do a variety of moves with his sword, Galaxia, and fly using his dimension cape. Similar to the NES Extra mode, you continue indefinitely but can't save, so there's still an endurance mode if you want one. Honestly though, Extra mode is where the play control starts to really detriment the experience. In the normal mode, Kirby's slightly delayed attack animations are annoying, but will never get you killed, so it's tolerable. In the Extra mode, however, these stray cheap shots are going to drain your shorter life bar much quicker, and because of that, I found myself dying a lot more often. Look folks, I don't have a problem with hard games. What I do have a problem with is when I feel like I'm losing for reasons seemingly outside my control, because that's frustrating, not fun. It's entirely possible that I just suck, but many of the times I died in extra mode felt like the game's fault and not mine. While a cool idea, Meta Nightmare grapples with similar issues. It feels like the designers deliberately set out to slow down some of his attack animations. Look at how long it takes him to go through with his up B. His regular sword strikes are a little more instantaneous, but if you dash and then slash, it slows them down just enough that enemies can sneak and touch damage. Also, whenever you try to fly, Meta Knight loses all forward momentum and floats along at a snail's pace. Moreover, some parts of the game were clearly not made with Meta Knight in mind. In a twist of irony, the Meta Knight encounters are a pain in the ass, because they take multiple hits and always manage to sneak and touch damage before you can attack them again. Also, using his upward strike will often spawn enemies run on top of you, as these fights weren't designed for upward attacks. Just compare how Meta Knight handles here to how he did in Superstar Ultra, and it's clear that that game had far and away the better play control. Honestly though, I played through Meta Nightmare a second time while writing the script, and the controls weren't as bad as I remembered them being the first time, so take my complaints with a grain of salt. Meta Nightmare is a cool reward for 100%ing extra mode, but the Superstar Ultra and Planet Robobot renditions are substantial improvements in my opinion. So, remake or rebreak? How well does Nightmare in Dreamland recreate and improve upon the original Kirby's adventure? Overall, I'd give this game a remake score, even though I had anticipated naming it a replace when I first started recording footage. The updated sprites are a commendable upgrade, the remastered music sounds really nice, the new art direction is an interesting but effective take for the series, and the presentation is fantastic. The two new sub-games are a lot of fun, while the new quick draw is more accommodating of input lag. The slightly improved play control and the superior performance make the play experience a lot smoother, and the addition of Meta Nightmare, while not perfect, is still a cool addition. Nevertheless, there were still some improvements that could have been made. The copy abilities, while loyal to their original incarnations, consequently feel just as limited when compared to future entries, while boss endurance has not improved over the originals versus boss sub game at all. I should also note that Nightmare in Dreamland supports 4 player co-op, but unfortunately I don't have the technology to record this feature at this time, and I've kept you guys waiting long enough. The result is a great remake that still could have improved a few more things from the original and polished its addition somewhat more. Another reason why I can't give Nightmare in Dreamland a replay score is because the original game still holds up remarkably well. Many would rank this in their top 10 NES games, and I can see why. Compared to most games in the system, Kirby's Adventure stands out for its depth and polish. The environments are surprisingly detailed, varied, and immersive, the art direction offers unique visuals for the series, and while the physics can make extra mode of pain in the ass, it never evolves beyond a slight nuisance in a standard playthrough. Pair all of that with a surprisingly effective story and good difficulty balancing, and you've got a true NES classic. Much like Klonoa, Door to Phantom Isle, I think this is one case where you should check out both versions of the game, seeing as each has their own unique art style and presentation. While great Kirby games in their own right, I wouldn't call it the best in the series. In my opinion, Superstar, Return to Dreamland, Triple Deluxe, and Planet Robobot are all vastly superior installments. And that's all the time I have for you today, folks. I know I promised we'd be doing Yoshi's Story next, but I'm actually going to be delaying that video for the foreseeable future. Instead, join me next time for another Remake or Rebreak episode on Kirby Superstar vs Kirby Superstar Ultra. After all, I didn't buy this expensive DS capture card for nothing. So, until then, I'm Exo Paradigm Gamer, and I hope you all enjoyed the review.